He was also a Newman Scholar at IPS in 2010. He's got a bachelor's from Morehouse College and two masters at the University of Oxford and a, as a Rose Scholar. Um, and then Jonathan over here is the director of the DC Youth Slam team. His kids just won second place at a national competition this year, so we're super proud of them. Yeah. They are actually performing this morning, so we're sad they can't be here, but if you see some youngsters running around later today, those are the DC Youth Slam team kids. And um, Jonathan just took some of those folks to South Africa to do a Sister Cities training this last year. It's been very busy, it's been a very exciting year. And um, to get started, we're gonna just have both of them do an excerpt from their work. So I think Tope, if you'd like to start. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming out. It's so good to be back, like in the kind of IPS orbit. Um, the piece I'm gonna read today is a piece uh, from a novel that I started writing when I was at IPS. Um, and I'm looking to publish the novel next year, the year afterwards. So uh, I guess the very act of writing this piece at IPS in itself was a kind of political act because in so doing, I was trying to remember what sort of early professors and teachers had told me, which is that if I, if I just wrote about my circumstances and my experiences, that I would be doing something that was explicitly political because I'd be writing from the perspective of a group of people who aren't necessarily represented very often in literature. Um, and so that's, I think, the, so the piece I'm gonna read today is, uh, it's called Miracle. And it's the piece that, uh, that I won the Kane Prize for. It's based in a church, basically kind of a Nigerian church in America. And, um, and a visiting prophet is coming in to give the people what they want, what they need, they think, and, and, those, and that's a bunch of miracles. So again, the, the piece is called Miracle. Our heads move simultaneously, and we smile at the tall, svelte man who strides purposefully down the aisle to the pulpit. Once there, he raises both of his hands, then lowers them slightly. He raises his chin and says, let us pray. Dear Father, we come to you today on the occasion of this revival, and we ask that you bless us abundantly, we who have made it to America, because we know we are here for a reason. We ask for your blessings because we are not here alone. Each of us represents dozens, sometimes hundreds of people back home. So many lives depend on us, Lord, and the burden on our shoulders is great. Jesus, bless this service and bless us. We ask that we will not be the same people at the end of this service as we were at the beginning. All this we ask of you, our dear Savior. Amen. The pastor sits and someone bolts from the front row to the piano and begins to play. The music we hear is familiar and at the same time new. The band leader punches up a pre-programmed beat on the cheap electric piano and plays a few Nigerian gospel songs to get us in the mood for revival. We sing along, though we have to wait a few moments at the beginning of each song to figure out what he's playing. We sing joyful songs to the Lord, then songs of redemption, and then we sing songs of hope, hope that tomorrow will be better than today, hope that one day soon, our lives will begin to resemble the dreams that brought us to America. The tinny and Nigerian gospel music ends when the pastor stands and he prays over us again. He prays so long and so hard that we feel the weight of his words pressing down on us. His prayer is so insistent, so sincere, that his words emerge from the dark chrysalis of his mouth as bright, fluttering prophecies. In our hearts, we stop asking if and begin wondering when our deeply held wishes will come true. After his sweating and shaking and cajoling, he shouts another amen, a word that now seems defiant, not pleading. We echo his defiance as loudly as we can, and when we open our eyes, we see him pointing to the back of the church. Our eyes follow the line of his finger, and we see the short old man hunched over in the back, two men on either side of him. Many of us have seen him before in this very space. We've seen the old man perform miracles that were previously only possible, in the pages of our Bibles. We've seen him command the infirm to be well, the crippled to walk, the poor to become wealthy. Even those of us who are new, who know nothing of him, can sense the power emanating from him. We have come from all over North Texas to see him. Some of us have come from Oklahoma, some of us from Arkansas, a few of us from Louisiana, and a couple from New Mexico. We own his books, his tapes, his holy water, his anointing oil. We know that he is an instrument of God's will, and we have come because we need miracles. We need jobs. We need good grades. 
We need green cards. We need American passports. We need our parents to understand that we are Americans. We need our children to understand they are Nigerians. We need new kidneys, new lungs, new limbs, new hearts. We need to forget the harsh rigidity of our lives, to remember why we believe, to be beloved, and to hope. We need miracles. Thank you. Um, so I'm a poet, and uh, I do performance poetry, um, spoken word, slam type stuff. Um, so the piece I'm going to do for you um, is my piece sort of dealing with uh, my personal identity and sort of relating it to the, the outside world and the politics associated with that um, in some ways. It's called uh, Dear David, and it's, it's me uh, addressing uh, the Star of David directly. A six-sided star fishes for identity on my chest. Tucked under a mixed family, it dangles like a worm on a hook under American waters. David, you've become a constellation we no longer strain to see. Like a king's crown, your yellow light showed us through the darkest times, exposed us to the darkest crimes when you labeled us a problem, a question. They answered with genocide, another problem, another question. They answered with atomic bombs, more problems. We stop asking and instead promise never again. We lie, dead, as our babies boom. Might as well drop them out of the planes. It makes as much sense as cartoons, as war propaganda. Dear David, they gave you a nation, but what did you say? Are you trapped between those two blue bars or can you still get away? Because Israel was dropped on top of Palestine and is there to stay. Like one triangle turned around and dropped on another. You see, David, my brother cannot be anti-Semitic if he is as Semitic as me. Isaac Ishmael just wants to be free, but you've got him building pyramids out of the charred dust of bulldozed homes in the Gaza, stripped of rights. You've let your brother sleep naked and hungry too many nights. You, you pharaoh, cashing checks from the West Bank. You've become settled in your thinking. Unlike our Torah, you do not move. You have not turned. You, you six-sided sinner. You blind Goliath. You have a hexagon center that points nowhere but inward. What are you looking for out in that desert? Is it another ghetto? Are you somehow jealous of the swastika's popularity among disaffected youth? I mean, are you trying to be a badass? Or are you just an abused child, grown up, molesting your nephew and calling him names? Dear David, our homeland is neither, just like the Christian right is neither, and you, my symmetrical friend, represent me no longer. You are a problem, a question. You answer with violence, repression, more problems, more questions. Your jagged corners do not know how to answer. How ashamed you've made us. I used to cover all my notebooks with tiny pictures of you. Now I tuck you under my short shirt in order to hide my association with my role in unwillingly supporting your racial, national, religious apartheid. You make me sick, David. Oceans away. You fish for identity on my chest, reminding me who I am because of how you can't be, reminding me where I come from by showing us where we can't go. You are a fallen star, not lucky nor bright, yet I still see myself in you far too often like some birthright trip to hypocrisy from Crofton, Maryland, because all I can say is never again as I tuck my necklace away and pray that we end this oppression. Thank you, you guys. That was beautiful. Um, so we're going to have a quick panel and then have some questions, and then we'll move on to some, some writing. First, I'd like to know, our, our workshop is called Communicating Creatively for Change. I want to know what that really means to you all. To you guys. I'll, I'll start. Um, <laughs> communicating Creatively for Change, um, to me, um, what it is about, it's not so much about changing how we communicate, 
it's um, about why the way that I've stumbled on other people's work, you know, either you know, in a magazine or just kind of browsing through a library or, or you know, s hanging out in the airport bookstore before my flight takes off or something. I mean, that for me is the ideal space. I do think a lot about representation, this idea that because I'm emerging from a very particular community, both of my parents are from Nigeria, I was born and raised in the States, that at some point, you know, one of my father's friends or uh, an aunt or somebody may read my work and may feel that I'm in some way misrepresenting them or, or that sort of thing. And I actually have encountered that in the recent past. Um, and so I do think sometimes about that when I'm writing, like should I be cognizant of the fact that somebody else may read this who disagrees with my perspective? Um, is my perspective you know, privileged because it's appearing in print and their perspective isn't, that sort of thing. But uh, again, those are barriers to I think writing as freely as you can. And so uh, I kind of think that if you're working on a piece of writing and you're revising it and you're polishing it and you're workshopping it, that the truth will emerge from it. You know, it might not be a truth that even you as a writer recognize, but something true and good and honest will emerge from that process. Um, and one of the most edifying things for me is when I read in public or when I, uh, somebody responds to something I've written, they say, you know, like, this resonated with me. And it's a kind of something that I assumed was a throw-off line or a transition point between one element and the next. And this person is saying, well, this really impacted me and here's why. And to me, it says that there's something about art that, again, is, it, you can't corral it, you can't sort of parcel it out, that it kind of emerges uh, on its own. And that's what I love most about it. You know, like I love watching films again and sometimes I'll be so taken by a scene and it's the first thing I wanna talk about when I leave the theater and my friends are like, What's, what are you talking about? That was, you know, whatever, I didn't even notice that. But for me, it's something that I think about for two or three days afterwards. And um, so, I mean, those are, those, that's what I'm obsessed with when I'm writing is, is sort of being honest and true. And I assume that the audience that needs to work or wants to work will find its way to it. Um, I have a little different approach. Um, a lot of my poetry uh, is very directed at specific audiences and, and has, a, has a very specific social justice theme to it. And I will have an assignment like, look, I need to have my piece about the prison industrial complex because I'm going to this rally and so I gotta write that piece. Um, and so often I, I have an audience in mind and I know what I want them um, to, to get out of my piece. Now, now that I work a lot with young, um, young poets and students um, here in the district, a, a lot of my pieces are directed towards them and, and towards the, the, the youth culture that can sort of um, gain, an, gain an understanding of an issue that they might not have a, an in-depth understanding of or maybe challenge something that they do know really well um, or something that's ingrained in them. So very often I'm taking into account my audience, um, especially because of the type of language um, like when choosing, the, the, the diction literally when choosing the words that I'm gonna use, um, I notice uh, that when I go around and perform, when I'm just writing myself, I have a, a lot of words in here that it, if, in order for the, the kids to understand it, I'd have to stop and explain like every single word, you know, every four or five lines. And so I, I find different ways of writing that makes it more accessible. And one of the things I love about spoken word poetry is it, it doesn't have to be in the, in the highest language. It, it can be in everyday uh, parlance um, and, and still be considered poetry, still be considered just as good as anything else. Um, and so, but yeah, audience becomes very important to me. Um, and, and it's something that can both limit my writing because I think about it sometimes too much, um, knowing that I'm writing for a specific audience rather than just writing to get it out. Um, but it's also something that I've utilized in making, in making my art a tool for social justice. I, I feel like I have to take into account who is the audience uh, that I'm speaking to and, and who do I need to be speaking to. So sort of like with, with that piece that you heard, uh, Dear David, that piece took me a long time to write, but I knew that there was a, a large audience of American Jews who needed to hear another Jew with that perspective. Um, and there's a lot of non-Jews who, who think that, you know, if someone is Jewish and American, therefore they support Israel and, and all that goes on there. Um, and I don't know why that's a thing, but for some reason that's a thing in the United States. People think that's true. So I, I had a very specific audience in mind for that, um, and, and it helped me frame the piece in that way. So I've enjoyed talking to some of your kids specifically, Jonathan, and one of the things that comes out is the similarity between hip hop and slam poetry. And through that, I'm learning that authenticity is a really big deal. So I'm wondering, and this question goes to both of you actually, to affect your audience, does your story need to be your own? Do you feel trapped into your experience maybe as a member of the diaspora? 
and um, how do you negotiate your own privilege and your right? This is a big question. I guess what I'm getting at is if you don't have pain in your life, can you write, um, can you write beautiful poetry? Can you, can you pierce people's hearts? How do, you, how do you step out of that? That's huge, sorry. Thanks, <laughs> I absolutely think you can. I mean, I, my sense is that that the trajectory needs to be, if you're an artist, and perhaps this is completely wrong, but at least this is what I've done, is that I need to kind of fully understand and comprehend my experience before I take it upon myself to write about somebody else's experience. But there are many writers who have, you know, done the opposite. They've written about somebody else in a really compelling way, and then get, but, and they're only able to write about themselves after that process. Again, any type of writing, I think requires a, a deep commitment to the piece, which means living with it, which means breathing it all the time, which means obsessing over it, which means you know walking around with sentences in your head and trying to shape them even if you're talking to somebody else. And I think that process, uh, that, that process, it doesn't allow you to be dishonest. Again, if, if I write a piece of fiction and I write it very quickly and I try to get it out there, in all likelihood, it won't be very good, and the reason it won't be good is not just because I've written it quickly, but it's because I haven't sat with it. It hasn't lived within me for a while. And so that if I was writing about somebody from an experience that I can't relate to at the outset, I suspect that I'd have to spend more time living with the piece and understanding who I'm trying to write about before the piece would resonate or be true. Uh, it's funny, I was just having a conversation with some friends of mine about Zadie Smith, and we were talking about a book she wrote a few years ago called On Beauty. Now, her first book called White Teeth was this literary sensation. Everybody loved it and read it and thought it was the best thing ever. And then she wrote a book called On Beauty that was, that was based in America. And we were kind of talking about the fact that the writing was very beautiful and we enjoyed the prose in it, but that it just kind of felt false to us. And the more I thought about it, the more it occurred to me that and you know, people could disagree with this perspective, obviously, but I think the reason it didn't resonate with some people is that she didn't fully understand the context she was writing from. She's trying to write about American, you know, sort of African Americans and other folks in a diaspora in America, and she's from the UK. And I think she made the assumption that the experiences are synonymous, and they're not necessarily synonymous. And so um, I just think it's, it is important if you're wanting to write from the perspective of, of someone else to understand that you are assuming a great responsibility and to take that responsibility seriously. Um, even when I'm writing about myself or a character who's very similar to me, I recognize that the moment that I begin to write about it, this person becomes different from who I am. This person becomes a person. And that's the wonderful thing about writing. And I begin to think about the character separately from myself. And so I begin to think about how I can honor the character and be as honest to that character and fair to that character as I can, even if at some point I have to do something that's, very, that's unsettling to the character, that, that in, even in the process of so doing, I'm respecting the life and aspirations of this character. Um, and I think that's one way you can, you can sort of do that. Um, right now in uh, the slam poetry world, uh, there's a very popular thing called persona poems. Um, and everyone seems to be writing a persona poem. Um, and that, that is a poem written from a perspective that is not your own, whether it's another person or another object or thing. Um, and so, so this idea of representation um, comes up a lot. And especially with young kids who are like, oh, I want to write from the perspective of this and the, from the perspective of this. And, and that responsibility that you're talking about comes heavily into play. And so we have to talk them and guide them through that and talk about what research is required um, to do that and what responsibilities you have as an artist. Of course, yeah, you got your free speech. You can write about whatever you want. But if you're going to get up and represent someone else's story, that you, you have many obligations uh, to them and, and their story. Um, if y'all want to see a beautifully done persona piece, um, one of our students who's going to be here later today, his name's Thomas Hill. Um, you can Google it. Um, if you Google BNV, just the letters BNV, stands for Brave New Voices, BNV and then DC, um, he'll come up in, in one of the top three. Um, I believe it was like round one or round two, but um, it's his poem he has called Scarecrow, where he, he wrote a poem from the perspective of a scarecrow in a field looking out to a tree um, where some men have been um, hanged. Um, and it's the most chilling piece that, that I've ever seen. And this kid's 16 years old and he wrote this amazing piece and then brought it to life on stage and performed it in the most amazing way. Um, so yeah, look that up, uh, you'll like it, it's a beautiful video. Um, but anyway, th this idea of um, representation and, and authenticity, I think is very important. And it's something that 
most writers, maybe not most, it's something that I should speak for myself. It's something that I struggle with, and I think it's, it's something important to struggle with, and it's something that separates us as progressive writers from other people, just the, the fact that we question um, uh, concepts like privilege. Um, the, the, the fact that that comes up and the fact that it's something that we interrogate, I, I think makes us who we are, but is also part of that obligation that we have as writers in a social justice context that we can't ignore these things. We, we have to recognize um, the privileges as they exist. Um, for me, that means, for me, that, that, that means bringing it up pretty much, um, calling it out, calling it what it is, and inviting my audience, my, my readers, my listeners into that dialogue. And, and a lot of that is questioning myself. And a lot of the, the best art, a lot of the best poetry does this. It, it's, a, it's an exploration of identity, of, of who am I, who are we, to be doing this work. Um, I've noticed it, it stops some people. It, 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 it can be um, handcuffs for some people. They, they might feel like they're not allowed to write about something. They might feel like they're not allowed to touch on this area. Um, and so when it comes to authenticity, I think it's like that freedom we were talking about before, to really be yourself, not try to be something that, that your audience wants you to be, um, or that you think everyone, you know, Zadie Smith is really popular right now. Everyone could go out and try to write like her, right? I, I, I would not recommend that people do that. I would recommend that they write like yourself, you know? Don't, don't try to write like whatever is popular, what you think people want to hear. Um, and so if, if I'm a, a a heterosexual white man um, in the United States, like, are people, do they want to hear a certain thing from me and not want to hear a certain thing from me? Probably, um, but if I'm just playing off what the audience wants from me, I'm not being authentic with myself. Um, and so it's, it's a constant struggle back and forth between those things, um, you know, marching those lines of political correctness while also trying to express something can be a real interesting job for an artist. Um, especially an artist engaged in progressive movements. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answered that or just brought up more questions. <laughs> um. We'll get to some audience questions in a second. But Yeah. That was definitely part of the plan. That, that's part of our plan for today, and it's something that guides my work, uh, this idea of popular education. Um, if you've never heard of popular education, please look it up. But, but the idea that you know, just because we're sitting up here it doesn't mean that we're experts and we know more than anyone else. Everyone comes here with a lot of knowledge and, and a lot of skills and background, and if we're able to share those um, equally in a setting, we can all benefit from that. Yeah. The other side of it, too, though, is that, uh, if I could just push back just a little bit, um, is that I've been to a lot of these kinds of sessions, and especially when I was trying to find myself as a writer, and it was empowering for me to be able to go to sit somewhere and to listen to somebody who said, you know, I've been through this really difficult process. I'm still going through the process, but I'm, I'm farther ahead than you are, and here's how I did it. Here's some things that I did to achieve that. And that, for me, was incredible, because I could go back home and say, okay, I'm not completely insane. You know, there is a, there is a strategy, there is a process I can follow, to get where I want to go. And even if I don't follow the exact same path that this person has, that, um, that I derive hope from this person's presence. So yeah, I think sort of trying to combine the two is really important. There might be, I'm sure there's some inspiring writers here. I, I hope there are anyway. And certainly I'm not saying I am the writer, absolutely not. But I'm saying that I, you know, I started writing this piece at IPS three years ago. And so three, 2010, you know, I'm, have no idea how to do this, and I'm going to as many talks as I can. I'm on YouTube 24-7 listening to people. I'm trying to see myself as a writer. Um, and it was hugely beneficial for me to talk to 
and listen to people who had been through that process. So um, I, do, I do think that both sides are important as well. And just real quick, just real quick to move, before we move into that next part, um, something to kind of kick us off into getting our minds ready to do some of the, this particular exercise. I'm wondering if, um, if you guys can sort of tell me how we can find the political within the personal. You're, you're mentioning that feeling of being handcuffed in, into your own experience, and that's definitely something that I've felt before. And so I know it's more powerful if when we can speak from a place of what we know, but then I also want to move towards being able to pull what I know and then talk about something that I want to change. So I'm wondering if you can tell me, how can we find the political and the personal to really reach people? Okay. And then we'll, then we'll um, take maybe a couple questions and then we'll start some writing. To find the political within the personal, um, it, it's a unique skill. Some people, it comes intuitively and they can see it in everything. And um, everything about their personal lives, they can always find something political related to it. Um, these are unique individuals and sometimes that becomes uh, a little too much. And it's like, whoa, chill out, your whole life is not a political protest. Like, sometimes you just fart and scratch yourself like the rest of us. Um, but hey, that's a political act too sometimes. Um, but uh, I, I think more so it comes, for most of us, it becomes difficult sometimes to say that uh, my life that I actually live live has some political significance or this thing that happened to me, this one experience, what, what were the underlying, what, what, what were the larger issues at play there that I might not have recognized at the time? Um, for me, the mark of a great artist or just a great thinker um, is someone who's able to take a common everyday experience and analyze it and really put a magnifying glass to their own life and, and are able to bring out some of those larger political issues. How they do it, I think, is, I, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how it can be taught, but it's, it's this thing of not over-exaggerating something, but really placing it where it fits within a context. And that, that, that depends entirely on one's outlook, on their own politics, on, on where they stand, on the issues affecting their lives. And so I think one, one of the best tools for that is uh, other people. Um, seeing your life and, and, and discussing it with other people or like Tope was saying, like living with that writing for a bit um, and not being rushed to sort of get it out, get it out, but to, to sit with it for a while and say, okay, th this was my experience. What was going on there? What, what, what are the many forces at play? Um, yeah. This is something I think about all the time because you know, I do have my politics, and my politics are important to me. But then again, when I'm thinking about writing, I'm thinking about craft. I'm thinking about composing sentences and how to make uh, the sentences sing and how to make them resonate with people, how to convince the reader with so much stuff out there to continue reading from one word to the next. I mean, that's my primary obsession. And I think that if you're interested in being an artist, that has to be the obsession. I mean, I think. I'm not sure, and perhaps I'm just speaking for myself here as well, that I can allow anything else to infringe on that process because then I'm not focused on craft. Um, craft is what enables me to tell the story I'm trying to tell in a very compelling way. Um, and so I think that, a, for me, a well-told story is one of the most beautiful things on the planet Earth. And, and that's every day when I'm sitting down and trying to write, I'm trying to write a story that someone will say was a well-told story. Um, and so my hope is that when I finish the process of writing something and I look at it you know, two months down the line or a, or a year down the line, that I can say, okay, I see that this piece is a reflection of me because this piece is attempting to affirm the humanity of the character in question, um, even perhaps in, very difficult situ in a very difficult situation. And that in itself is a kind of political act because so much of the stuff that we interact with is constantly engaged in the act of stripping the humanity away from the protagonist. If it's the kind of, every time something happens in a particular neighborhood, for example, you know, uh, a, a media crew will go there, they'll find, you know, some, they'll, they'll find a black woman or a black man that they perceive as being inarticulate or something, you know, you know, blast it over, you know, they'll blast it over the airwaves and then two days later it's on YouTube and everyone in their cubicles is laughing at this person who, you know, said something. That person has been stripped of their humanity, right? Because within the context of a 30 second to one minute clip, you know, this person says something that sounds ridiculous and every, it becomes a catchphrase, you know, for all of two weeks and then people move on. There's no sense of, 
of who this woman is, where she comes from, um, what she loves, what she hates, uh, you know, who she, who she makes love to, who has rejected her in the past, who she has rejected in the past. All that stuff, all those crucial components of her humanity are stripped away. And so that when I sit down at the table, I'm trying constantly to give that person his or her humanity back. And that itself is a political act, I think. One of my favorite movies um, of the past year was Fruitvale Station, which I saw a couple weeks ago. It's about Oscar Grant, who was unfortunately um, killed by some BART police officers. Uh, and the reason I love the film so much was just because it was so committed to getting at the humanity of this character. He ceased to become s simply a, uh, an angry black man. He was really angry in certain scenes, and I thought that was amazing as well, because oftentimes artists will pitch in the other direction. If, if you have an artist who is a progressive artist, they'll say, well, this person for his entire history and the history of his or her people has been, um, has been marginalized. So the only, only way that I can give this character his or her humanity is to make this person perfect. And obviously you're not doing that at all. You're creating something that nobody in their right mind can relate to. But this film was committed to portraying both sides of the character. In one amazing scene, you know, he's getting mad at his boss for firing him, and he's helping another young lady who's trying to make something. He's giving her a recipe, and he actually puts his grandmother on the phone with this lady. And so I thought it was a beautiful scene because it said, here's a really complex, multidimensional human being who, like any of us, messes up, but who, like any of us, is capable of doing tremendous, beautiful, wonderful things. And the tragedy in this case is that he didn't have the chance to recognize and realize his full potential. For me, that's a great story because it's getting at the core of the humanity of this person. And that's what I'm trying to do. I want to get at the core of the humanity of the characters I write about. And I think that in itself is intrinsically political. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions before if, we If begin? I could just add real quick before we oh. do that. J just along these lines, just a real quick tidbit for y'all. I think, and this is something you already know, but just to reiterate, um, to really, the, the best artists in terms of making the personal political, it's about zooming in and zooming out. Um, and it's about being able to zoom in on some minute detail. And, and I notice this in, in my favorite poems as well. They take this one little detail, describe it to us beautifully, make it a metaphor for something, then zoom out, and all of a sudden, in this tiny detail, we're seeing the entire world. Um, they zoom out to this large, global, universal thing, and then all of a sudden, they bring us right back down to that little thing where we were the whole time, and we're still right there in that minute detail. And so if you have that ability to zoom in on something, then zoom all the way out, then all the way back in, um, I, I find that, that that's one of the best things that, that artists can do in terms of making the personal political. Awesome. So if Joel, if you could grab the microphone, and we can bring it around and grab a couple of questions, and then we'll start writing. So if you want to start, we'll write down a few, and then we can answer a few at once. Yeah, I'd like to um, connect Tope and Jonathan uh, around the issue of craft and structure, mm. uh, form, uh, and how is that done in terms of spoken word, where you're interacting with a group, where people are snapping their fingers in terms of acceptance perhaps of content, but not necessarily structure and form, and also because you're a teacher, how do you teach spoken word, what's the criteria, and have there over the years been a body of people who have emerged as critics of spoken word who can say, okay, this is good, this is not good, based on specific things dealing with structure? No. <laughs> um, that, that, that there have been uh, some forms taught and some structure, but in terms of um, creating like a, a canon or, or a group of critics who can say legitimately something is better than something else, um, no. It, yeah. Yeah, um, and, and so the, the, the question was like, how do we evaluate then spoken word like, like, like we do other art forms where, where, where there's a, a set structure, a set forms, and, um, and, and that's what I love about spoken word poetry. Um, we call it poetry for the people, by the people. Um, and, and we really let audiences decide what they like and, and what they don't like. And the, the way that I end up judging is what resonates with me. Did I get goosebumps? Um, and it's about that authenticity. It's about that wh when it's performed, how do I feel listening to it? Um, and, and, and that often has a lot to do with the content. It also has even more to do with the presentation and how it's performed. Um, 
But in terms of the actual forms used, like I brought up before, like persona poems have become very popular. Um, rhyme and rhythm play a lot in spoken word. And, and so there, there are forms, there are structures that we can look at. Um, and like, like in spoken word, um, enoughera, uh, re repetition of a phrase or a word over and over to have some desired effect happens again and again and again. Um, because it happens a lot, does that make it a good thing or a bad thing? Different people will, 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 will differ on this, right? I, I tend to think if everyone's doing it, don't do that, go do something different. But if it's tried and true, maybe that's the form that makes something good in that field. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think there's a set standard and it's part of what I love about spoken word. Spoken word is relatively new. Um, I mean, well, spoken word goes back to the ancient times, but like slam poetry was invented in the 80s and, and has spread in popularity since then. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think we have like a standard uh, relative to other art forms where, where you can really judge it in the same way. Any other questions, or did you have something? I would just gonna say very quickly that it's, it's something I think about a lot as well with respect to slam poetry, but with rap, a certain canon has emerged, um, and you have critics who are saying, you know, like for example, last year, everybody was talking about Kendrick Lamar's album and, and saying it was one of the kind of best albums in a very long time from, <laughs> some people might disagree with that. <laughs> I'm just saying, he kind of emerges somebody who a lot of folks are saying, oh, here's the next, you know, sort of Nas, or here's the next Tupac, or here's, here's somebody who's actually in this to advance the state of the art. Um, and I love those conversations because obviously art is subjective, people will disagree vehemently, but um, th there was, they were drawing a distinction between somebody like Kendrick Lamar and somebody like Waka Fla Flock of Flame who was just kind of yelling and screaming at the top of his lungs, right? They're saying that here's a guy who's interested in, in the way that words go together. And, and so I, I suspect that as slam matures, that that will con perhaps happen there as well, unless that is something that slam is opposed to. I, I, and, and I think there has been a kind of, I, I grew up reading Saul Williams. He went to Morehouse and I went to Morehouse and I respected him a great deal. And I think he's somebody who a lot of people see as a kind of dean of slam poetry as well. And people recognize that he is objectively a very good poet, right? So I think that will, uh, I'm treading on your territory here and I don't want to misrepresent you, so <laughs> that's my perspective. It's very true and it, and it brings up a good point because there's, uh, now let's go on to more questions. I, 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 I like it, it brings up a great point in terms of like how we can actually judge who the intention of an artist and, and what they're there for. Um, and I think that's why everyone loves Kendrick because we're like, oh my God, uh, a rap artist who actually cares about the art form um, as opposed to everyone who's just trying to make money. Um, and so in slam poetry and spoken word poetry, it's the same thing. It's like, oh, this jerk's just up on stage trying to impress some girl in the audience. Like, he's not, he doesn't care about the craft. Oh, he's just got some political message. So often people could see me as that. I come up and I do my anti-war poem, like, oh, that's some anti-war guy, and he also happens to do poetry. But he's more so just, he's got a message and it's really didactic. Um, and so I, I think that comes back to what you were saying before about the craft, and it's about, and, and for, uh, for me, it's about combining those two things. It's about showing that my craft is forefront and is so important to me, but the message is also important um, and, and not, not letting my intentionality get in the way of how I'm respected as an artist as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I kind of have a two-part question. Um, the first is with, every, like with all the different social media platforms and different things going on, how important is it to be able to tune everything out and to just take time to listen um, and just pay attention to the world around you as a writer. Um, and the second part is how important is, is uh, how important is that process and just really fully understanding who you are to become a great writer? Okay, let's take a couple more questions and then we'll handle them all at once. So right behind you, Joel. Yeah, right. Hi. Um, I'm from Boston where we have uh, story slams, so it kind of combines the two, oh. and I've been doing them religiously, and I'm on the board. So kind of like the moth. Um, there have been proven studies done that the brain waves of the audience will merge with the speaker mm. if there is vulnerability. Mm. So authenticity, vulnerability is what creates the authenticity. So if you are speaking from the heart, which is a, you know, in this case, it's a personal narrative under the theme. Um, you actually connect in a way that is physiological as well as, as uh, on an emotional level. So I guess my, my question would be, how can we get the word out 
uh, in larger audiences, I guess, to start creating connections that create community. Mm. Because I think that's what we all need to do in order to survive as a society, yeah. is actually be in the room together. And I think that's what you were bringing up. How can we all work together and, and share that information and not have somebody talking at us, but talking with us? Awesome. So anyway. Awesome, thank you. And we have time for about one more question. And then we're gonna get going. Thank you all. Um, for, as experienced writers, would you talk about the hard stuff? What you, for example, is it Tope yes. reference listen, learning from people that are experienced around their blocks or what was hard? Yeah, and yeah. if you could share specifically about the privilege of having the pen and, and the theft of people's stories, representation. Mm -hmm. I recently had a, I'm trying to work through something like that. And if you could share all of you mm -hmm. from that, I would be <coughs> grateful. Start with the first couple cool. questions, Jonathan. Okay, uh, I'll start with the social media one. Um, I, I think it's a real interesting phenomenon now about, um, you know, do we need to tune out? Do we need a digital detox and get away from all these uh, computers and, and all these things and go get in touch with the quote unquote real world? Um, I'm finding more and more that social media is our real world now. Um, and if we want to be in touch, so to speak, well, uh, I, I don't think we need to get away from that. Um, and I, I don't think we should see that as something that's not real anymore. Um, that like that that is real life, um, and it's especially something that's really important with uh, students and working with high school kids because you know the uh, the what they call it keyboard courage, right? Where people can go and they can say whatever they want and start bullying people online and talk all sorts of smack because you know I'm behind a screen and I don't really exist. This is some fake world out there. Um, I'm I'm a big proponent of no, be yourself in real life, be yourself um, on the screen as well. Um, and so for some people, uh, so th that, that is a thing. I, I, I think we don't need to get away, but for some people I do recognize that they do need an escape. Um, they do need a writer's retreat. They need to go um, sit down by a lake and meditate and chant and do things, and that's okay. Like whatever it takes to get your mind right. Um, if you need to drink and smoke and do whatever you need to do, like that, that's your life. Um, but, but I think you're on the right track in terms of what, what you were saying. Like you, you said both tune out and listen. Right, and so to me, it's that listening part. It's that whatever it takes you to be able to listen um, truthfully to yourself, to nature, and things like that. Um, if if you need to 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 get away from social media to do that, so be it. Um, but I, I I don't think that that's a necessity for that. Um, yeah. Um, I come at this from a slightly different perspective. I worked at Google for a couple of years um, before coming to IPS, and so I had to be constantly be connected. I had to constantly be accessible via Twitter, Facebook, text message, phone. Um, and I kind of took pride in the idea that I was always available, that I was always on. But what I came to understand when I left was that essentially all these other thoughts and perspectives and beliefs had kind of, they, they were sitting in my mind. I wasn't quite sure. In other words, anytime you're processing a thought in terms of how will this appear on Twitter, I think it becomes problematic. If you're thinking, oh, this is great, and then you're trying to compose a nice tweet in your head so you can tweet it, I think you're kind of corrupting the process of, of perhaps becoming the best artist you can be, unless, of course, you want to be a Twitter artist, which is another thing entirely. But I wasn't so interested in being a Twitter artist. And so, I mean, one of the, I kind of backed into this, and I don't want to act as if this was intentional, but one of the best things that happened to me when I left Google before I came to IPS was that I came in 2008 when the financial crisis started. So. I was not able to get a job for a pretty long time. Um, and so I'd saved up some money from Google, and I was sitting in my you know, sort of apartment by myself, and I was thinking, okay, so what am I gonna do with my life? Part of the, uh, part, partly terrified because I couldn't get a gig. Two, I'm incredibly competitive, and I knew all my friends were like at you know, consulting firms making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, and I was thinking, wow, they're getting ahead of me. And I just had to kind of sit back and allow all of that stuff to pass away, and the only reason it did was because I kind of disengaged from social media for a long time. And I stopped thinking about comparing myself to others and competing, and I said, how can I do good by myself? How can I do the best by Tope? Um, and so I started to read poetry, and that, in, the process of reading poetry, I think, really slows you down in a really interesting way, because you have to slow down to comprehend what the hell you're reading. And that's different from kind of reading a Facebook post or, or a tweet. You know, you have to really invest yourself in the process of fully comprehending that. 
And when I, after a year of just kind of reading nothing but poetry and not looking at Facebook or social media, something else new and exciting opened up inside of me that enabled me, I think, to become a much better writer. That would not have been possible without the, this extended period of disengagement from social media. This is not me railing against social media, but it is saying that if you want to be a great artist, you have to find that part within you that, that cries, that, that is happy, and, and that part that is kind of unmediated, that's not connected to something else. In other words, it's not crying and laughing because somebody else is making you do, do, do that, but because you're aware of what it is that makes you a human being. And once you get to that space, I think it becomes much easier to get back to it. You know, so even if I am on Twitter and Facebook now, not that often, it's very easy for me to get back to the artist inside of me. And I think that would not have been possible without that period of disengagement. Thank you. So Jonathan, if you could take on how to create community and get the word out, and then Tope, if you'd like to talk about the hard stuff, and then we'll get started with our writing exercise. In terms of this idea about vulnerability, creating connections with the audience, um, I'm, I'm right with you. That's like the truest thing ever in, for a spoken word poet, um, and it's something that you can feel, right? I'm, I'm big on vibes, and, and you can totally feel that in a room. Um, we, we, when you see some of my students come in and do their poetry, you will see it <laughs> among everyone in the audience and on their faces. You, you can tell that a connection is being made. How to get the word out about this is a damn good question um, because um, it, it's something that it, it, it's something that I feel like there's a whole army of people out there on the other side who might disagree with. There's a whole bunch of, of, of people who just don't feel it or, or don't want to admit that it's true or that, that they too can be vulnerable in this way if they allow themselves to open up and, and listen. Um, but I feel like things like the Story Slam, um, here in DC we have something called Story League, which is the same thing, it's a competition, a storytelling competition, um, and it's grown in popularity immensely. Um, things like that and Poetry Slam I think are helping Snap Judgment, the NPR show, we're getting a little more traction. There, there's a TV show now called uh, Verses and Flow, where they have spoken word poets on TV One. Um, and so I, I, I think that's helping a little bit in terms of getting the, the word out. But in term, I, I think what you mentioned before about the physiology of it and the studies showing that it actually happens versus us saying that we felt it, I think that might help a little in terms of getting it mainstream, in terms of getting it into our education system um, so that our students can be learning in a way that is both um, emotionally tied to it and intellectually tied to it. Um, that, th that would be an amazing next step for me that I don't see happening anytime soon. It's still, it's still sort of in the realm of entertainment and th this is what entertainers do um, versus this is what humans do. Um, with respect to blocks and uh, theft of story, I'll deal with the, the blocks first. I, I, for me, I, blocks are about fear. I mean, it's completely tied into fear. I'm terrified that it's not going to be good enough. Uh, I'm terrified that I'm not saying what I actually want to say. I'm terrified of how long it's going to take to write the thing, you know, and I want to do it more quickly. Um, and so once I began to approach the blank canvas, the blinking cursor on my computer without that fear, the things were much easier. I mean, I, it was much easier for me to produce every day. And it wasn't even about, you know, sort of, I wasn't trying to write the perfect story every day. I was just trying to express what was inside of me. And this is tied into some of the stuff I was saying before. There was something in me. I mean, I think a lot of times when you're writing, you're, create, you're painting or whatever else, that the thing that's inside of you that needs to get out will get out in a way you can't control the way it gets out of you, right? You can't, you can't parcel it out. You can't, you know, <laughs> you can't demand that it comes out in a certain way. It'll just, it'll kind of happen. And so the process of um, just, just writing and committing, for me, the discipline of writing every day is what helps with that. So that every day I know that I'm going to write for a couple hours and whatever happens, happens. And I might have something in mind, like I want to fix this part of the story that isn't working or quite landing for me, or I want to write a new story, but I'm just going to write and see what happens. And what I've discovered is that even when I'm going back three or four months, one of the best pieces of advice I heard from somebody was to write um, one piece and then to put it aside and then start writing something else. Because by the time you return to the first piece, it's new to you and you can see where the flaws are. And the, the most fascinating part of this process is that I, when I go back to things that I assume I will like, I usually don't like, but there's always, always something tucked away in that piece that's amazing, that, and again, that's honest, and I can build something around that 
that kind of bit of honesty in the piece. And I'm only able to see that with distance um, and again with a kind of objective viewpoint. And so I would say just try to be fearless. I know it's easier said than done, but for me that's been really key in, in, in getting stuff out. And um, I guess with that of story, I'm not quite sure what you're, you're talking about there, but at least when I think about the way that my story has been told, if, if you'll allow me to say that, and certain people have told stories about people like me, and I grew up reading those stories, and I thought, wow, that's crazy. I don't even recognize what this person is or who this person is. And so that's part of the empowerment, I think, that comes from being an artist. You can take it on yourself, and it's entirely possible that uh, my brother, say, or, or a cousin, or somebody that I grew up with will see what I've written and say, well, that's not honest, that's not quite how it happened, and that person can take on the story for themselves as well and, and write their own version of it. So I think there's something to be said. I like a kind of, I like being in a country where there is so many voices out there and so many ways to learn about who I am by reading what other people are saying and, and so many opportunities as, as well to express myself. I think that's a wonderful thing. Thank you. All right, Jonathan, let's kick Let's kick us off. Cool, yeah. Uh, so we're gonna do some writing, everyone. Um, real quick, I just wanna address um, the question about the, the hard stuff and the difficulties. Um, the, the main difficulty, I feel, is just being judged and, and knowing that we're gonna be judged um, and dealing with that. Because we all know that, that bad art does not make social change. Bad poetry is not gonna change the world. Um, and so it, it's, it's dealing with that and knowing that um, we have to be good in order to be effective. Um, that, that, that to me is the biggest challenge um, be, because it's, it, it's about something bigger than yourself. Um, but, but like Tope said, you just gotta be fearless and, and you gotta blow past that. Um, and it often helps to have some, something in between. Write something, go do something else, come back to it with fresh eyes um, or put some other, some, ask someone else to look at it for you. Everyone got this worksheet, right? Cool. Can you use the microphone, please? So two things that happened to me this week, and obviously this is not just about me, but is this on? Mm -hmm. I mean, one was uh, seeing a small movie about Vaclav Havel, a documentary. Yes, started the Avalon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, maybe in our constitution we could add a thing that says every third term an artist or a writer <laughs> or something has to be president of the country because they come at it from such a different, did you see the movie? I've seen it before. Yeah. I love Pablo. Yeah. Right. So it was so moving in a way because here he was a playwright and as president of the country he had to deal with a political life that was so different that he had had in his previous living. I mean, in fact, I think shortly before uh, he became president, he was in prison by right. the previous administration. So it just seems, you know, I don't know what this says about anything except what it affected me was how inspiring it would be, how far we are in the United States and most other countries. I don't know how many countries have had artists as the heads of their countries, but it sort of brings a whole different, you know, artistic perspective and political perspective. Uh, Ronald Reagan was an actor and Arnold Schwarzenegger was an actor. Well, so. yeah. Al Franken's doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Um, but, but Roger, if we could, we need to get into the writing exercise. We only got a few minutes left. Yeah. Th thank you, we appreciate your participation. Um, so everyone has this sheet. D did people have a chance to write down um, experiences on it? So at the top of the sheet, it asked you to write down three stories or experiences that you had. Um, on the, I think on the front, it said experiences that, that have some sort of political significance that you could see, and on the back it was, that have no political significance whatsoever. If you haven't had a chance to write down those stories, please take a chance and jot down now at least one or two. If you, if you can think of all three, that'd be beautiful. But I'm gonna tell you the next step as well, just so that we can keep this moving. What I want you to do after you have those three stories in each category, or just one, I want you to create some sort of comparison, a metaphor, a simile for that story or for some character in that story. Um, so it could be the situation itself, and you can talk about the situation of that experience in that story and say, it was like a this. Or you could pick out a character, yourself in the story, someone else in the story. She was a lion. He was a boulder. 
yada, yada, yada. Does it make sense? Everyone's got it? So we're writing down some experiences, choosing one, coming up with some comparisons, a metaphor, simile that fits that story. You've got three minutes. <laughs> I know, right? No fear. <laughs> <laughs> Joel, you got that microphone? Awesome. So um, we don't have time for everyone to share, but if there's a few people who would like to share ones that they wrote, whether it's from uh, the whether it's from the front side or the back side. But now nobody else is. <laughs> <laughs> would anyone like to share what they wrote, whether it's from the front side or the back side? Our man Roger. Please. Please, we, 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 we'll, we'll take a few. We'll go, we'll go Roger, then we'll go in the back, then we'll go over the, on this side here. Cool. So I, I don't know that I, that I did write something, but when I took a class at the writer's workshop a year ago, and, uh, and I did end up writing it, but they told me I ended up speaking it better than I wrote it, so I'll speak it in a way. And, huh? Basically, it's a story, uh, three lines about my wife and I meeting when she was six and I was nine at a left-wing camp in New Jersey, <laughs> one of the interracial camps at the time, and uh, both her mother and father and my parents were in the Communist Party, and uh, she was this little girl and I was nine years old, and we had this instant connection to each other, not only because of that we shared this in common, and at least me felt totally alienated in a world where, you know, my parents were being harassed and I felt outside of, mm -hmm. you know, the world. And, you know. So, so this was on the front for the clear political right. undertone. Well, no, it's not. No, this is the back, think, not, not clearly. I often don't think that distinction is clear in my own life. I mean, mm -hmm. the political and the personal have gone together a lot. Yeah. But the point is, you know, now we've been married 48 years, and both of us at one point worked at IPS, actually. So, Roger, wh what was your comparison that you made? I don't, I don't think I did that. That's the what we're asking you to lion. share. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, so to be clear, that's what we're asking you to share, the comparison that you made off the story. Um, so she was of this, I was of this, this it, it was, the situation was. <laughs> All right, let's get a couple more people to share. Thank you, Roger, we appreciate that. Okay, quick, uh, quick few sentences. I looked up at the maple tree growing out of the box bush next to my house. When the tree was small, I ignored it. Now, it's taking over the bush, growing faster, spreading its limbs. Mm -hmm. but, could I, but I can see I have to make a choice one day, kill the tree or allow the bush to die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Funny how nature mirrors U.S. foreign policy. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Fair. We had someone else. And Annie, did you want to share? Awesome. C can you use this microphone, please? Thank you. Reading it's going to be. A <laughs> it was nearly five when I let myself into Michael's apartment. Hmm, not alone, and the game was about to start. I sat at the dining room table and scanned the walls, admiring the plates along the rail on the top. And then a, light, a slight tremor made me sit up straight. And for 15 seconds, I lived in terror as plates left the rail and crashed around me, and the walls shook till plaster crumbled. 1989, quaking. Very nice. Thank you so much. Is anyone else? Oh, yeah, man right there. Ever so caution, uh, aware of his surrounding, he nibbled away at his work gratefully. You could stare and he would stare back. 
if, if you got too close, he would push away. But if you just watch, uh, in, if you just watch, a keen sense of peace would develop inside of you. That shy, inverted artist was like a deer, beautiful to watch, careful not to trust, but able to connect deeper than most human beings because you knew it was real. Sweet, thank you. Um, so what I want to do next, um, I want you to choose one. Specifically, I want you to look on the, on the side of the page that one of one of the experiences that has no political significance. Um, and I want you to try to do that zoom in and zoom out thing. I want you to take this experience that you feel doesn't have a lot of political significance, take that comparison that you wrote for it, that simile, that metaphor, um, and use that as the beginning for a new piece of writing, whether it's, it, it, it's whatever you want it to be. There, there, there's no, it doesn't have to be a poem, it doesn't have to be a story, it doesn't have to be a letter. It can be whatever you want it to be. But I just want you to write creatively um, and try to zoom in on that one experience and then try to zoom out and find something larger, some context that can make it political, that can make it related to something much bigger than what it actually is, and then to zoom back in on that and then to bring us back to that small thing, back to where we were. Does that make any sense at all, a little bit? Cool, we have about five minutes to write. So bring your writing to a wrap, bring it to a close, finish that idea, whatever idea you're on right now. Um, we've gotta close out. Um, we got two members from the DCU SLAM team who just walked in, so I'm gonna ask one of them to close us out with a poem, but if there are a few people who wanted to share, we have time for maybe two people to share, and I see two in the back. Um, so we're gonna hear from them real quick. Thank y'all so much. Um, and Tope and myself will be around. Um, you gonna be around all day? Or, um, yeah, we're, we're both gonna be here all day. Um, so we'll be able to come talk with y'all and kick it. So um, yeah, please, if you could share what you wrote. Um, hi. Um, if I could guide one child to give her direction she already knows, or if I could save 20 children from further abuse, and if the centers could franchise and spread all over this land and multiply by numbers far greater than the span, if I could write books for hundreds of thousands to read, to offer them more knowledge, to clutch them with greed. If I could enter the cozy cocoons by airwaves from coast to coast and penetrate with voice the minds of thoughtful fate. But where would my speeches then leave me in the midst of limited time? For I so then choose to relieve thee of our illusions of